today we're standing at the waterside within minutes of where I now live, where I was raised as a child. The reason we're here is to illustrate how one man arrived at the understanding that God can and will repurpose lives. To even say that is to admit that there's a power great enough to alter the trajectory and the meaning of our individual lives. That one man was Simon Peter. He discovered this. By the seashore one day, God demonstratively proved to one man that he could indeed change the unchangeable, alter the unalterable, and redeem the irredeemable. Does that sound amazing to you? It does to me too. In fact, I think it does to everyone. Dr. Brené Brown is a researcher and lecturer at the University of Houston. She recently said, I think if you follow anyone home, whether they live in Houston or London, and you sit at their dinner table and talk to them about their mother who has cancer or their child who's struggling in school and their fears about watching their lives go by, I think we're all the same. As that Christmas song says, the hopes and fears of all the years that we all have the same hopes, the same fears. And if God could take an unknown fisherman and transform him into his chief apostle, then that same transforming power must be available today. For God is no respecter of persons, and our God doesn't change. If God did it for Simon Peter, God can do it for you. Hello, my name is Ken Gurley, and this is the second session for the four tables where we introduce the very first table. Let's call this session Your Second Chance. There's an old adage that we use that says opportunity only knocks once, and on occasion that's true. There are many things in life where we only have a single chance to act, and if we don't respond assertively and quickly, then we don't get that opportunity. But in God's world, he operates on the principle of second chances. Consider some of the second chances God offered in scripture. Gideon's a great example. When instructed by God to be a deliverer of his people, the young man asked for a sign, leave a fleece out overnight. The next morning, uh, the ground would be dry, but the fleece damp with the evening dew. It happened, but somehow Gideon wasn't convinced. So God did the inverse. The next morning, the fleece was dry, but the ground was wet with dew. What about Jonah? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, he rebelled. But we read the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And who can forget John Mark? Paul broke company with the beloved Barnabas over this young man. But years later, Paul said to Timothy, bring John Mark, he's profitable to me for ministry. The enemy spends a lot of time trying to convince each of us that we can't start over, we can't begin again, we can't find a fresh start. But down in our hearts, there's a longing for a second chance. As Louisa Fletcher put it, I wish there was some wonderful place in the land of beginning again where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door and never be put on again. There is a land of beginning again. There is a place of starting over. And Simon Peter had to find that place. Why? Well, let's talk about that a bit. Let's talk about Simon Peter's life. What could take a rough, burly, and sometimes short-tempered fisherman and transform him into this chosen vessel of God? Only one thing, one thing so powerful changed his life. As we know, Simon and his brother Andrew were called by Jesus from a seashore to become fishers of men. And they, along with James and John, who were also fishermen, followed after Jesus. Simon Peter had moments of brilliance when he proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, when he stepped from a boat and walked on water, when he tried to stand up for Jesus in Gethsemane. 
Yet ultimately his own willpower and strength failed him in the greatest test. And before a fire, he denied three times knowing the Lord. The rooster crowed and Simon Peter wept bitterly. But three days later, Jesus rose from the grave and an angel told Simon Peter to go to Galilee and there the risen Christ would appear to him. And on the seashore that day, where he had once been called of the Lord, the failure faced off with Jesus. And Jesus found them fishing near the shoreline in Galilee and was instrumental in them catching a miraculous amount of fish. When Simon Peter realized the man on the shore was none other than Jesus, he dove in and swam the hundred yards or so to get to Jesus. When he arrived at the shore, the risen Lord had grilled some fish and had some hot bread waiting. Jesus had spread a table before Simon Peter and his disciples. In spite of their failing him, Jesus offered grace. That table that Jesus spread was none other than love, and that is the first table. As I mentioned earlier, the four tables are four action verbs that will repurpose a life. There is an order to these action verbs, and love must come first. Each of these tables represent an altar. The writer of Hebrews said, we have an altar. The altar is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where God so loved the world that he gave himself to us and for us. So this first table is our love for the one who loves us the most. Our love for God is the primary table. Love always comes first. David Mitchell once said, if the human condition were the periodic table, maybe love would be hydrogen at number one because love comes first. Jesus said the first and greatest commandment is that we love God with everything in us. In the fruit of the Spirit, we find love leading the list. It's supposed to be that way. John said we love him because he first loved us. Such love comes first. Before the Lord could repurpose Simon Peter's life after his failure, this table had to be in place. Simon Peter's love for God had to come first. You remember that moment by the fire? Jesus looks at Simon Peter and asks three times, do you love me? He asked it three times, some say, because Simon Peter had denied the Lord three times. He required a threefold affirmation from Simon Peter saying, yes, Lord, I love you. Simon understood then, as we should understand today, it's that love that revolutionizes our life. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we can understand all mysteries and all knowledge. We can have faith to move mountains. We can speak in tongues of men and of angels. We can give ourselves sacrificially. We can have it all and do it all, but if we don't have love, we are nothing. Love is likened to a raging fire in Scripture. It's the fire that melts the dross, removes the impurities, and transforms us from something base into something precious. Across the table at the seashore that day, Jesus began the repurposing of Simon Peter's life. He offered him a second chance through love. We sing a song in our church that says, I found a love greater than life itself. I found a hope stronger and nothing compares. I once was lost, but now I'm alive in you. A love greater than life itself. Greater than any failure in our life up to this moment. Greater than death, life, principalities, powers, things present or things to come. Life starts again at the first table of love. Do you remember the woman brought to Jesus and thrown at our Lord's feet? She had been caught in the act of adultery and the law said she should be stoned. But in our Lord's actions and remarks that day, she received a second chance. Imagine when she looked up into those eyes as bright as a Galilean sunrise and heard him say the words, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. A second chance, a repurposed life. Jesus is called the day star. He's likened to the sun rising in its strength. He's the new day in our life. And our only hope resides in the one who can make all things new. So don't abandon that first table, the table of love. The church of Ephesus did and had to go back and reclaim their first love. If we love God, we'll obey him. If we love God, we'll find our strength in him. If we love God, we will speak with him and read his word. If we love him, we'll want to be like him. If we love him, we will seek to please him. Simon Peter took advantage of that moment. 
A few days later, the same man who denied the Lord in front of a few stood before a huge crowd and proclaimed the gospel to some of the very people who had been instrumental in crucifying the Lord. You have the opportunity for a second chance. Draw near to the table of love. He will meet you there. He will show his love for you. The one whose compassions fail not. The one whose mercies are renewed every morning. He tells you again and again how much he loves you. And you have the chance to love him in return. For when his love is reciprocated, you've been given a second chance. Come to that first table of love.